This time we'll talk about the consequences of the mechanical and structural properties of the arteries on blood flow dynamics. In general, as we move along the aorta, the arteries become more stiff, but also more nonlinear in their stress strain relation and more viscoelastic uh, as we go from the aortic trunk to the smaller vessels. The ratio of the wall thickness of the vessel to the diameter remains fairly constant at about 0.1 until we reach the arterioles when it increases to about 0.2 to 0.4 because remember those are the resistance vessels with the larger uh, amount of smooth muscle in their media. In the venules and veins this ratio is smaller as low as 0.01 to 0.05. So here we see a plot of the Young's modulus uh, at different levels of the aorta going from the top down towards the femoral artery in older subjects and younger subjects. And you can see particularly in the older subjects, the stiffness of the vessel increases um, towards the smaller arteries. Here's the outer radius, and you can see that the radius decreases as you'd expect and is a little lower in the young subjects. And here's the wall thickness to diameter ratio, which not only increases as you uh, get towards the arterioles, but is larger in older subjects. So here's data uh, as a function of age in humans and you can see that the elastic modulus of the abdominal aorta increases four to five fold over about seven decades. So how does the elasticity of the vessels affect the blood flow? Well, one of the first consequences is because there is a pressure drop along the vessel that creates the flow, that means that if the vessel is elastic, then the tube will tend to taper because the pressure is lower at the downstream end. So if we assume that Poisseur's law applies, then that pressure gradient is equal to minus 8 mu over pi a to the fourth times q, and we'll call that equation 1. Now let's assume that there's a linear relationship between the vessel interior pressure and the radius a. So therefore, as a function of position along the length x, a is equal to a naught, the original unpressurized radius, plus alpha over 2, the compliance, times px minus p external. And for this example, we'll assume that the external pressure is 0. So therefore, it's a naught plus alpha over 2 times p of x. So from the chain rule, dp dx is dp dA dA dx, where dp dA is 2 over alpha, where alpha is the compliance. So that gives us that 2 over alpha dA dx equals minus 8 mu q over pi a to the fourth, which we can rearrange as a to the fourth dA equals 8 mu alpha q dot over 2 pi dx. Now the boundary conditions on this problem at x equals 0 and x equals L are a of naught equals a naught plus alpha over 2 times p1, the entrance pressure, and a at L equals a naught plus alpha over 2 times p2, the exit pressure. Now we integrate a to the fourth with respect to a to obtain one-fifth a to the fifth evaluated between a at 0 and a at L. So then integrating 8 mu alpha q dot over 2 pi with respect to x gives us 8 over 2 is 4 mu alpha q dot over pi times L, which is the integral of with respect to x evaluated between 0 and L, which we can rearrange to give us that q dot equals pi over 20 mu alpha L times A at naught to the fifth minus A at L to the fifth. Or substituting for these expressions in terms of the pressure, 
we obtain the pressure flow relation where the flow Q equals pi over 20 mu alpha L times A0 plus alpha over 2 P1 all to the power of 5 minus A0 plus alpha over 2 P2 all to the power of 5. So this is the pressure flow relationship for an elastic tube in which we've assumed that the Poisseur flow still applies even though the conditions for Poisseur flow are not exactly correct anymore since the tube would taper. But there's an interesting property we see of this pressure flow relation. Not only does it now have a fifth power dependence on the radius instead of a fourth power dependence like Poisseur's law, but you can see the effect of the upstream pressure and the effect of the downstream pressure are separated. Now, if, for example, the downstream pressure was half the upstream pressure, and therefore the downstream radius was half the upstream radius, then that would mean that the contribution of the downstream term to the total resistance would only be about 3% of the contribution of the upstream term. So one of the consequences of the elasticity of the vessel is the vessel can taper as a result of the pressure gradient and the influence of the downstream pressure becomes less and less significant. And this phenomenon is sometimes known as the vascular waterfall uh, because like in a, a waterfall, the amount of water flowing over the waterfall doesn't depend on the flow conditions at the bottom of the waterfall, only at the top. Another consequence of vascular elasticity is wave propagation. So the pulse wave is an elastic wave that propagates along the vessel wall. And we can derive the wave equation for pulse wave propagation by making a number of simplifying assumptions. We first assume that the vessel is an infinitely long circular elastic tube. Next, we assume that the Fluid flow is homogeneous, incompressible, and inviscid, meaning we ignore the effects of viscosity. And we further simplify by assuming that the flow is one-dimensional, so we don't consider the flow distribution across the vessel. And we assume that the amplitude of the wave is small and the length of the wave is long compared with the vessel radius. And this will allow us to assume that the gradient of the cross-sectional area is very small and that consequently the uh, rate of change of velocity uh, is also very small. So the one-dimensional version of mass conservation we can derive from that the condition that the flow is constant dq dx equals zero and q would be the mean velocity u times the cross-sectional area so that would be d dx of ua which is u da dx plus a du dx is equal to zero. Now taking these derivatives in terms of x and t we get u of del a del x plus del a del t del t del x plus a times del u del x plus del u del t del t del x is equal to zero. Expanding that out, we get u times del a del x, which we can assume is small, plus u times del a del t del t del x, which is one over u, so we get del a del t, plus a del u del x, plus one over u del u del t, which we again assume to be zero. So conservation of mass in one dimension with these linearizing assumptions based on the assumption that the wave amplitude is small and the wavelength is long. Next, using the chain rule, we'll turn del A del T into del A del P del P del T. And so we get that the conservation of mass for a one-dimensional flow in which we can linearize the effects of the wave becomes del U del X plus 1 over A del A del P, which is a property of the elasticity of the vessel, as we saw in the last example, times del P del T is equal to zero. And we'll call this equation one. Next, we can write conservation of linear momentum 
in which we have the transient inertial term rho del u del t plus the convective inertial term rho u del u del x, remember this is one dimensional, equals the pressure gradient minus del p del x. And again, our linearizing assumption enables us to uh, ignore this small term, leaving us with del u del t plus one over rho del p del x, which is equation two. Now, if we take the derivative with respect to x of equation 2 and subtract the derivative with respect to t of equation 1, we obtain del 2u del x del t plus 1 over rho del 2p del x squared minus del 2u del x del t minus 1 over a del a del p del 2p del t squared. These two terms cancel to leave us the second order differential equation del 2p del x squared minus 1 over c squared del 2p del t squared is equal to 0, where the wave speed c in this case equals the square root of a over rho times del p del a. And this equation is known as the wave equation. So it turns out that not only is P governed by the wave equation, but because P is a function of cross-sectional area due to the elasticity of the vessel, and U is related to A by the flow relation and mass conservation, it's easy to show that the wave equation also governs U and A. So we can also write del 2U del X squared minus 1 over C squared del 2U del T squared equals 0, and del 2A del C squared minus 1 over C squared del 2A del T squared is equal to 0. So we can see that in this linearized problem, the pressure, the velocity, and the cross-sectional area are all governed by the wave equation, all with the same wave speed, which is determined by the stiffness of the vessel, del P del A, the cross-section and the density. And solutions to the wave equation take the form P, or U or A, equals a function of X minus CT plus a function of X plus CT. And so you can see that if you plug this into the wave equation, that the wave equation is satisfied automatically. Uh, and you can see that this represents actually the sum not only of a forward propagating wave with a wave speed of c, but also a backwards propagating wave. So in general, uh, pulse waves propagate not only forward along the arteries, but also backwards when they reflect off branches. So the specific shape of the pulse wave and the specific solution to the wave equation will depend on the initial conditions. Um, but for our present purposes, uh, the important uh, result here is that uh, the elasticity of the vessel allows the pressure the area and the velocity to propagate at the same speed as pulse waves along the artery. Now, the pulse wave velocity is usually much faster than the flow velocity, so don't confuse C with U. And the magnitude of C is dependent on del P del A, which is a measure of the stiffness of the artery. So the higher the pressure change for a given cross-sectional area change, the stiffer the artery, the higher the wave speed. In veins, which are very compliant, the stiffness is lower and the wave speed can get so low that, in fact, the flow velocity can catch up. And in that case, you have the equivalent to what we have in supersonic flow, uh, where um, a shock wave can occur. And that shock wave in the venous system can result in the flow limitation. So here we see uh, in real data the uh, effects of the changes in vessel elasticity uh, from young to old and as we move along the aorta on the measured wave speed. And so as expected, as you go down the aorta, the walls get stiffer and the elasticity gets higher the vascular compliance decreases and the wave speed increases quite a lot.